So it's the 2017 Open Hardware Summit. And so after lunch, we tried, we decided we're going to try something a little bit different this year. We're going to have a panel. All right, so, so we wanted to do a panel. So the format of this panel is going to be about an hour of us talking. And then we're going to open it up the floor to questions. Oh, yeah. I, I asked really easy questions. So we'll get you started. Um, so to, to my right, I have Ben Malou. Right? Ben Malou. Cool. I have Tony Fossenstein. And I have Mike Osman from Ray Scott Gadgets. Ooh. Sweet. All right, so these things, okay, I would say by and large we're mostly introverts here, so when I'm at an introvert party like this, I have one question that I use to get people to talk to me, and that question uh -huh. works for everyone, and it's, what are you working on? Because everyone's working on something, everyone has something they want to talk about, and it gets the ball rolling. So I'm curious, what are you guys working on? I guess I got stuck with the mic. Uh, <laughs> right, right now, uh, I'm working on a whole bunch of stuff, but, but like the thing that's sort of been fascinating me lately uh, is this direction finding technique for radio systems uh, called pseudo Doppler, uh, where you use a single radio receiver and a bunch of antennas, and you, you cycle between them rapidly, you switch between them, which simulates having a single antenna that moves around. And when you have an antenna that moves around, it creates a Doppler shift. And the phase of that Doppler shift is dependent on the direction of the radio signal you're detecting in. So we're playing with the pseudo Doppler direction finding and, and making uh, some merit modifications to that direction finding technique, like uh, making it asymmetric or doing pseudo random hopping patterns between the antennas uh, to try to eliminate needs for calibration and potentially like uh, eliminate the possibility that somebody can spoof a Doppler shift on their signal and try to pretend that they're in a direction that they're not. Kinds of fun stuff like that. That's what I've been playing with recently. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working on an art piece for several months now uh, called Theraminus Rex, which is a giant dinosaur, but it's also a theremin, so you can dance in front of it and then it makes a bunch of dinosaur noises based on the directions. Yeah. Um, and I've been using ultrasonic sensors on that, but unfortunately something I did not plan for, which is why it's been taking so much longer, is that it turns out it's really hard to build a circuit like that that's weather resistant that also fits into a dinosaur. So, <laughs> if anyone has any suggestions, I'm all ears. Wow, that, that's hard to top. Um, <laughs> I've been, uh, we've, at, at LF, we're working on a lot of new products uh, for our 3D printers, so we've got New tool heads coming out and new uh, new printers next year. Um, additional new accessories. So there's there's a lot going on between R and D and marketing right now just to get all these new products out the door. Um, so yeah, like I said, not a lot of comparatively. Are you printing is still interesting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we so take it for granted. I guess. <laughs> That's the future. We just start printing everything. Um, okay, so. Uh, not only you're from Allspot and SparkFun and Red Scott Gadget, so these are all open source companies. So I, I think, you know, I look out here and there's a lot of people who are either starting companies or have this itch or something like that. And I, I always find people's origin stories important, or the company's origin stories. Like, at what point did people decide, uh, I don't like a steady paycheck, I'm going to go and try to start something. And it's going to be way more fun than having a boss. And so I like to understand people's stories about how each of these companies came into existence. Sure. Um, so our company was founded uh, by Jeff Mo in 2011. And his whole reason for starting the company was he was seeing what was going on with the RepRap movement, which was uh, basically making 3D printers that could make parts and make more 3D printers. Uh, he saw a business opportunity in that, and sort of an opportunity to uh, do in hardware what he'd seen in, in the free software world for a long time, which was people collaborating and innovating together would increase the rate of innovation um, and essentially bring open hardware sort of to the place where Linux was in the free software world. So um, started the company really with the idea of it growing and it has. A lot. <laughs> Uh, SparkFun was started in 2003 by Nate Seidel, I don't know if Nate's here, so. Um, but he was a student at CU Boulder, actually, so right up the road, and at the time blew up one of his projects in his electrical engineering class, 
And in 2003, it was not that easy to find replacement parts. So he got the great idea to order a bunch of parts from Olmex and start reselling them to all his friends. And that sort of started SparkFun. So here we are 14 years later almost. And uh, that, that was just kind of found a niche and found a need for it and fulfilled it. So. I'm actually the founder of Great Scott Gadgets, and uh, we're a little bit of a smaller company. Um, like almost our whole team is over at the table over there, uh, notably missing Taylor, who broke his leg in two places a couple of nights ago. Uh, uh, we are uh, another Colorado open source hardware company. We're all Colorado companies, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, Taylor, by the way, uh, is the person who designed these really cool. Uh, open source hardware logo modified Colorado flag stickers. Uh, we have tons of over at our table, so so go get like lots of these because they're super cool. Uh, and uh, anyway, I was in the field of information security. I was doing wireless communication security research, uh, which is a little bit of a different niche than most folks here. But uh, uh, I started doing some work on Bluetooth just for fun uh, with Dominic, who's leaning over against the pillar over there. Uh, and uh, Dominic Spill and I kind of started collaborating by email and doing research. And we started, we made this technique for monitoring Bluetooth devices uh, and like detecting non-discoverable Bluetooth devices and doing security testing on Bluetooth systems and that kind of stuff. And we, we, we published some information and talked to hacker cons on like how to do these things and and like we had this Kluge solution that required you buy a couple thousand dollar SDR software by radio platform and then like take a soldering iron to it. And uh, not a lot of people wanted to do that, it turned out. And like we, we thought we were making a, a solution that would allow the information security community to assess Bluetooth systems the same way they could assess Wi Fi systems. And there were really good tools for Wi Fi, but there weren't for Bluetooth. We wanted tools to be available. And it uh, turned out nobody really adopted our techniques except for the NSA. And so we, we kind of wanted that to, those techniques to be more available to the whole information security community. And I started thinking about how to do that. And I ended up designing this little board called UberTooth One, which is a little USB dongle that's a special purpose Bluetooth test tool. And it was quite a journey to get there because like, I didn't know how to design electronics. Um, and uh, but I, I managed to make it work eventually, and once I had it working, all my friends in the industry were saying, when can we buy it? And I'm like, uh, here's the design funnel, so you can build it. And they said, no, we really want to buy it. And so there was this Kickstarter thing that happened around then, and I, did, I put up Ubertooth on Kickstarter just to see what would happen, and see if I could get a, a manufacturing run done, and it turned out it did really well on Kickstarter, and I started this company, and a few months later, I quit my day job, and now several years later, uh, We've continued to grow and build new products and have more people in the team, and we're still focused on the information security community primarily, but also we serve other folks as well, uh, general purpose hardware hacking and, um, and like amateur radio and other folks. Uh, and our main product is HackRF1, which is a software-defined radio platform, uh, and I'm our primary hardware designer and founder, and that's where the company came from. So you guys... You guys brought up one interesting point, and I, I've been lucky enough, I've seen companies built across the United States. So we have three successful, great open harbor companies here in Colorado. Is there something in the water here, or what, what's, what's going on in Colorado that makes that possible, or, or sort of spurs that on? Do you guys, I mean, you don't all have to answer this, but if there's any... I'm not sure what... You open your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the reason for it is, but I mean, it definitely seems to be like I moved to Colorado specifically to work for a lot of objects. So I think I don't know what started it. Like you know, it's sort of like what made the Big Bang happen. But like the fact that it happened is, I think, drawing more people that are interested in free software and open hardware to Colorado. So there's that. I think also just having the companies that are here, it brings more awareness into the area about open hardware and free and open software. So it's just sort of a accumulation of that knowledge and it spreads out from the area organically. Okay. Um, so do you, do you guys see, do you, do you 
you see any difference in running an open hardware company versus a closed hardware company? Have you seen the difference in, in the way things operate, or do you, and, and, and how so? What, how is it different? Uh, from my standpoint, from the product development standpoint, I think it's a lot easier working in an open source company because we don't have to worry about signing NDAs or patents and dealing with patent lawyers and all of that fun legalese stuff, which I would much rather not deal with and I'd rather just work on the products. Uh, so I think that's the biggest thing for me, but I think it also you builds up a lot more community because when you open source something, you can have the community give you feedback real time. You're not waiting two years for a closed source platform to go live, and then you're suddenly getting all of your customer feedback. So I think those are the big things for me. Yeah, I know nothing about running a closed source company because I've, I've only ever run an open source company. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we, we've always been 100% dedicated to open source. It was, it was, my vision for the company was just to build open source hardware before I, I even built a business around it. Right? That, my, whole, my whole goal was to make some hardware and make it available to people. And then making a business became the vehicle to accomplish that, uh, not the other way around. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, and I'll second the, uh, what Tony said about community. I mean, other companies in the 3D printing industry approach us at trade shows and conferences, and they say, well, you know, you guys have such an amazing community, how are you doing this? And like, well, we share everything we do right away, you know, so they can see what we're working on, they can see what's coming down, you know, coming down the pike, they can download files of things that we already produced, and I mean, that, like, level of trust sort of goes both ways, and really builds a lot of loyalty um, among your customers, so um, I think customers that, or companies that don't uh, make open open hardware or free software are sort of stacking the deck against themselves in terms of the fact they have to earn that trust some other way. Um, and we just sort of, we just take it for granted at this point. So do you, do you think the customers themselves sort of self-segment? Or that's to say that there are open hardware customers and there are closed hardware customers and never the twain shall meet? Or do people come over to the light side? And yeah, well, I mean, like Mike said, it's it's odd the customers you attract sometimes by making open products too. Like um, you mentioned the NSA, um, <laughs> but, but but I mean we you know we sell to all kinds of companies and organizations that are extraordinarily closed and proprietary also. So um, some of them are buying. I mean, ironically, are buying open source pro projects or products so that they can work on very closed source projects. Um, and they need basically the flexibility in their hardware and software to do things that they can't do with proprietary hardware. So it's, <laughs> they, they definitely mix and intermingle, but the community itself is, is definitely, tends to be where the, like sort of the hardcore, freely ray open people um, mingle. I would say also to address your point of people coming to the light side, um, it, you can definitely see that moment when you explain to somebody who's only ever used closed source hardware of, no, you can take this and customize it however you want, and the light bulb goes off of, wait, I could do anything I want with this? I can change this to exactly how I want it, I can make this work the way I want, and I don't have to, you know, sign all these, again, like the legal documents or anything like that, and I can teach myself, and you can see that light bulb happen, so. I mean, I, I think almost anybody who buys open source hardware also buys closed source hardware because sadly we live in a world where not everything you buy can, you know, there isn't an open source option for everything that that uh, you're likely to use in your life or in your business. And, uh, uh, you know, we're heading in that direction. Uh, that more and more things are available open source and, and there are certainly people who, who I encounter who try to use open source hardware and software everywhere they can, uh, that's definitely, uh, I think, a, a pretty large percentage of the folks who use our hardware are, are kind of in that category where they're looking for open source systems and they specifically want the benefits of uh, being able to customize things or being able to kind of support themselves uh, or they just believe in open source and they want to support the companies that are doing open source. And uh, I appreciate them because they keep us in business. So I got, I have a two-part question. So uh, 
you know, there are these open solutions that people are now starting to build other, particularly software, that people are starting to build hardware, and like a shout out to KiCad in particular, right? Like I think two or three or four years ago, if you would have said, you know, there'd be an open source EBA that would be completely open source and people could use it, everyone would be like, no, no, I'm not, not for professional development. But it turns out people really have been pushing on it, really working hard, putting in the sweat effort and making sure the systems are great. So the two part question is, what, out there that you've been using recently, do you think in, in terms of the open hardware, open software community, are going to be like your new favorite tools? And then where where are the gaps? Like what, what does somebody, if they had like an entire free year to go build, write, design a piece of software, what, what would you suggest they go do? Uh, one of the things that really excites me right now is the, uh, the actual momentum that is, is finally happening in the world of getting open source tools for FPGA. Um, like many years went by where a lot of people talked about maybe trying to make open source tool chains for FPGAs or dabbling in like an open, an open source tool chain or one, one particular part of a particular device and sort of making something kind of halfway work. But we actually have like fully working tool chains now for uh, for uh, the uh, Ice 40, for example, um, and that project, Project Ice Storm, and some of the related projects like Yosis, are producing uh, some really effective and useful open source tools um, for a, a whole, uh, a, a whole kind of growing field of uh, open source development for ASICs and FPGAs. And it's super exciting to me because ultimately we're going to be in a world where, where we will be building open source silicon. And uh, you know that's starting to happen now, but I can see that growing a lot in the future. And right now, the only kind of complete open source tool chains we have for FPGAs are for fairly small FPGAs, uh, but that's changing. People are working on kind of growing that ecosystem and, and targeting bigger platforms. Um, and there are also smaller platforms, like if you've ever seen the, the Green Pack, uh, they're like these little tiny FPGA-like devices that have uh, some kind of interesting analog components in them. And uh, Green Pack, this is Lego, the company that makes Green Pack, like, they didn't even have a, a, an HDL synthesis tool at all. They only had schematic entry. But they published their bitstream format. Uh, so that somebody could go and, and without even really having to reverse engineer, uh, build an open source tool chain for their product, and that's happened, and that somebody is Andrew Zonenberg. And, and it's possible now to make uh, HDL uh, for the green pack and synthesize it entirely with open source tools, and, and actually with support of the company that's making the hardware, which is super exciting to me. And there's so much more potential there. The big FPGA vendors like uh, uh, Altera, Intel, and uh, um, Xilinx, like they haven't really gotten on board with this yet, but um, there, there's so much momentum, and I'm super excited about it. Um, so at Aleph OpEx, we only use free software to run everything in the company. So from uh, marketing to our ERP system to everything we do in R&D. Um, all that is free software, um, which is pretty unusual and, and it's a challenge, but it really it really highlights the areas where um, improvement would be great and where things have come a long ways. So definitely with, um, with KiCad or KiCad. Which, which is it? Chris? Yes. It's both. Yes. Uh, <laughs> with those two softwares. Um, you know, like things have come a long ways. Um, in marketing, we're you know we're using GIMP and Inkscape. We use Blender for all kinds of things, from 3D modeling to video editing to motion graphics. Um, we have a free software ERP system um, based on Odoo, but now it's Oka, uh, which is forked off, which is the Odoo Community Association, and we use Oka for like everything, from inventory management to uh, Timesheets for employees um, to uh, order entry, all kinds of stuff. So, like the tool chains are just—I mean, they, they've come so far in just like the three and a half years I've been in the company. It's crazy. And what's really driving that, I think, is more and more companies actually using those tools. 
I would agree with that. I think just the, the fact that all these different tools are becoming much more commonplace and more cross-compatible for all different platforms for people, that, it, that is, it's not one particular thing that's really exciting to me. It's just the fact that it's becoming more accessible overall. I just want to add one more thing about KiCad. We, we also do open source tools entirely in-house. Uh, rare exceptions might be like once in a while we've had to do an FPGA synthesis or something. Um, but, uh, the, uh, but KiCad in particular, I've been using exclusively for seven years now. Um, and I, don't, I think a lot of people don't realize it's been usable for that long. Like every single product that we make, including Ubertooth One, my first product, was designed with KiCad, and, and it wasn't as easy to use back then, but it could be used, and I was able to design a four-layer RF board and make it, a, you know, manufacturable and everything using entirely open source tools seven years ago, and, uh, and even though it wasn't the best tool for the job, maybe, in terms of functionality, it was the best tool for the job for me because it, it allowed me to use open source tools and promote open source tools and provide feedback to the people who were building the open source tools and contribute back. And I think that's one of the key things uh, that we try to do is that when we're, ma we're making everything open source, so we want to use open source tools and when we find ways that we can make those tools better, uh, we try to contribute back. We're not always great about that, but but if we avoid using open source tools, we're going to lose the opportunity uh, to, uh, to make the tools better. So I kind of have a, it's kind of an interesting question. So what, what is the open source business stack of tools look like? What are you guys using on a day to day? Is there anything in there, is there anything in there where you're like, oh, there's this one thing I, I wish we would go and have a better version of? Uh, I, I would say, Speaking from a marketing perspective, it would be motion graphics. Um, like we can do motion graphics uh, with um, uh, with Blender, and then there's um, I'm trying to think of the other animation program that we use a little bit. Michael, Frida, yeah, um, and then but there's that other the, the other uh, vector based one, um, Inkscape. Well, yeah, I mean we use Inkscape a lot too, yeah, but. Anyway, uh, motion graphics, like, um, in general, I don't miss um, my Adobe software, except for when I want to do motion graphics, and then I kind of want to curl into a ball. <laughs> <laughs> I would say for us, uh, our marketing team, definitely, we have to kind of pull them away from that stuff a lot more from the closed source programs, but also, um, I, I think the other point of contention a lot of times for us is uh, Excel spreadsheets. That's a big one where people have a hard time with the learning curve on open source versions of that, and so they're really tied to that program for some reason. So, well, I, I mean, like for my perspective, it's always been math. Please make it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's another one. Um, okay, so so how? Let's let's talk a little bit about like component selection and how you actually go about building these things. Is when you're building an open product, how does that make you think about component selection or you know sub assembly selection and things like that? What do, you, what do you look for? Uh, first thing I usually ask is, do you have a data sheet to go with this? And a lot of times, suppliers will balk at that question, and they you know, they kind of are taken aback. What, why do you want the data sheet for this component if it's going into one of your builds? And um, that has definitely been a, a deal breaker for us at times. So if they are very actively against sharing that information, we can't share it with our customers. That Why would we go with that then? Yeah, we, we definitely have the same criteria, and, and and also we really try to design things such that people can build them themselves. Um, yeah, that's important to us, even though you know some of our designs are really big and complicated, and very very few people are going to want to build them themselves. We still want that to be an option. We still want uh, people to be able to buy the parts uh, in single quantity, and that's that's something we really look for. We don't want to design around parts that can only be bought 10,000 at a time. We want to buy, we want to design around parts that can be bought in a single quantity. So that if somebody comes up with an interesting modification of our design, they can actually build it in house and prototype it. Uh, that's super important to us. Um, we, so, and, and, but documentation is probably the number one thing. Like 
if there's no public documentation available, then the park doesn't exist, in, in my opinion. Uh, I, I'd say in general, our products are, you know, we, we're not building like necessarily a, a PCB, like a PCB would be part of, you know, the 3D printer. So those individual sub-assemblies, for us, it's really important that the licensing be free. So, like our um, our main board um, is produced by Alt Machine, and that's uh, you know all got good free licensing and good source documentation. Um, we've actually encouraged some vendors to change the licensing on their products from like a non-commercial license to a fully open license because they. They basically miss, we're missing out on an opportunity to sell products to this. So like with Hot Ends, for example, uh, there's a company out of the UK. Uh, we really like their Hot Ends, but they weren't, they weren't freely licensed, so we couldn't do business with them. Well, they, that's changed, and so now our, you know, we're making a next generation of tool heads that are using their, their Hot Ends, which the customers appreciate because it's a very popular piece of hardware, but we specifically didn't use it because it wasn't, you know, it didn't meet our standards in terms of as you guys have grown, so you, all of the companies here, I think, have grown pretty substantially over the years. As you've grown, have you seen people actually get more and more responsive to those sorts of requests? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's you know, that's that's one example. Um, I feel like there was another company recently that um, opened up what they were doing. Who am I thinking of? IC3D. IC3D. Yeah. So. Um, Film vendors in, in the 3D printing industry have been notoriously proprietary. So there's all these printers that will work with any given filament, but the filaments themselves were developed, you know, are developed with the, with the closed process. So like um, we had film vendors pursuing us, and you know, you can only sell so many different brands of one particular type of plastic. So the, you know, our, our sort of knee-jerk response to some of those people was like, well, if you make it open source, and so a company called IC3D in Ohio said, sure, we can do that. So they actually went through the steps to get their filament OSHA certified, which was awesome. So uh, so we sell their filament, um, and it's great. You know, it's a great material, but it's, you know, the best thing about it probably compared to other materials is that the entire process is documented so other people can learn from it. Um, so, so we're if we're talking about going up your supply chain, right? So your supply chain, you're getting vendors going up, but people are also, and, it, and I think this is particular for Sparkplug, people are making derivative works now too. So what what would you guys like to see from people making derivative works? Like what what is the proper proper way to go about making a derivative work from you know, a source hardware project? I think uh, the hardest or the, the most problematic area we have with that is just that people don't understand the licensing and so they don't follow it appropriately. So if they're making derivative works, that's awesome. Um, you know, we encourage it. That's why we have all of our documentation online so you can do that. But the problem that we run into is, and it's not even necessarily a problem for people prototyping in their houses or making one or two boards at a time. It's more of companies that are doing this and they're not following that share alike um, part of the licensing where they're they're saying that, hey, we started out with the SparkFun board and built our product around that. Uh, and I think, honestly, for us, it, it doesn't affect us at the end of the day other than it hurts the community because then that doesn't inspire other people to say, oh, hey, here's this product and that was based off of this other product and maybe I should look at open source too. Maybe that would work for me as well. Uh, and I think, at least for me, that's, that's the real failure on that. Uh, I, I'd say the other the other thing we see a lot of is, is what we call open washing, and maybe we'll get to that later. But um, so, but companies in the three D printing industry that maybe they're using Marlin firmware, um, which is you know free software firmware, or they're you know they're using or they they allow non non proprietary filaments or something like that for the printer, and so they call it open source, and so we really struggle with you know having to explain to people what it means to really be open source hardware versus just saying it's open source because some part of what they're doing is open. It's also interesting that those companies don't seem to recognize the fact that they're able to exist because of this whole like open source ecosystem that existed before their company did or before their design did. Like you're using, you know, one chunk 
of an open source, um, you know, like if you're using open source firmware on a proprietary piece of hardware, it's sort of, it's like there's a, a disconnect there somewhere. Yeah, definitely, I, I agree that the, the thing that, that I'd like to see people making derivative works do better is to honor licenses. Uh, and uh, we haven't really had a problem with that so much, but like uh, we've been using for years kind of share-alike style licenses, and we're actually in the process of migrating more towards more permissive licenses. Like if you're familiar with software licenses, we're moving from the GPL to BSD. Um, and the main reason for that is because even though we like the, the concept of GPL in theory, we like people sharing just the same way we do, uh, in practice, uh, it really isn't that important to us. The most important thing is that we get our our contributions out into the community and they get used somehow. And we want to see our, our contributions used. And if somebody that isn't sharing alike according to our license, do we really want to try to enforce that? Probably not. And if we're not going to enforce it, then maybe we shouldn't even bother with that restrictive license that requires them to do that. Maybe we should just use a more permissive license because that's what we really care about. Um, so we're, we're in the process of trying to make that easier for people doing derived works uh, by having a simpler, more permissive license that they can do anything with. And, um, you know, we have plenty of people cloning our products, of course, um, but there are also some interesting derived works from our products, and, uh, and they're exciting to see, uh, regardless of how they're licensed. So, so the, the interesting thing is I feel like there's there's different components, right? There's the, the, the road legal component of a license, but I also feel like there's the, there are laws, right? And then there's niceties, like every community has a nicety. It's not something that we require, it's something that we do because we're nice people. Are we, you know, are, what are some of the, are there any sort of unspoken rules or niceties that you'd like to see in, in, in the community, especially when people make derivative works? Mm, like, should cool. they drop you an email and say, yo, I made this thing, sweet thing, thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, actually, that's one of the best, that's one of the things that uh, that hasn't happened that I would like to see more, is people just letting me know when they've made a derived work, uh, because sometimes I find out about things uh, later than I would have liked to. Oh, one of the best derived works that we've ever seen from any of our products was uh, the radio badge at Chaos Camp two years ago in Germany. Uh, they made, they made 5,000 of these things like a conference badge, electronic circuit board that was actually a hack RF. Like, this is a very sophisticated RF tool um, that was based on hack RF one And it was modified in some cool ways. That it, a lot of the modifications were made just so that they could kind of accommodate parts that they were able to get donated, but they, they made it work. And it was amazing that they were able to actually make this thing and design this thing and make 5,000 of them and just give them away to all these hackers in a field. And it was it was incredible, but I didn't even know about it until it was publicly announced. Like, and this was like one month or less before the event, and I was like, oh man, I gotta go to this event, like in Germany, next month. Uh, and it would've been really nice to have a heads up, like when they started working on it several months previous. You know. I would echo that. I think uh, just telling the people that you're deriving, uh, whose original design you're deriving from, that it helps inspire them too, and it gives them feedback on how they can improve their designs. If you found a fatal flaw or just a general improvement, share that information. That's the whole point of open source. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo the same thing. Not not even just as far as our hardware is concerned, but. In the 3D printing community, there's you know sort of an ongoing debate and, and challenge with attribution um, and honoring licenses with 3D models. You know there are repositories of the 3D models online, um, and you know people can pick them up and remix them and do all kinds of things, but they don't always uh, honor the, the original license that was applied to the thing. And in some cases, the original license wasn't even <laughs> like they didn't have permission to really give it that license in the first place. So it's, it's super complicated. Um, I've done a little bit of work with Creative Commons on trying to sort that out. And a big part of it is they've sort of resigned themselves to focusing, focusing on norms versus focusing on the legalities of it, which is exactly what, what you just said. Uh, 
Um, so Mike had a really interesting point, and it's so whenever you go and build something or write some code, and then you put it on the internet, and then all of a sudden you find out that somebody made something cool with it, you're like, holy moly, that's the coolest thing ever! I didn't think, you know, this was just me doing stuff in my basement. I didn't think anyone else was watching. So do you guys have some stories about the the most interesting thing that's been derived or made from your work? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so. People that uh, know us have probably heard this story uh, before, but we have um, customers at NASA, and fortunately they shared this information with us, but they they bought our printer specifically to do some testing of some really high temperature aerospace grade plastics. In order to do that, they had to heavily modify our printers to get them to actually print those plastics because they printed a higher temperature than our hardware is rated to. So they they used um, used the CAD files, you know, from our source repositories to reprint all of the three D printed files for the printer in the first place out of a higher temperature material. Um, then they also did things like isolating uh, the electronics from the, from the rest of the hardware, and they they added air cooling to the stepper motors and added like an array of halogen lights. Uh, along the bed to add infrared heat to the plastic so that it would stay at a higher temperature. They had to modify the firmware a lot to do that. Um, and basically, we were able to make a printer that could print this higher, higher temperature plastic uh, than it's meant to be able to print. Um, in the process, they also found out that the polycarbonate pieces that they reprinted in order to print the higher temperature plastic were um, failing at the temperatures they were running it at. So they reprinted all the parts for the printer out of PEI, um, which is the super high temp plastic they were printing uh, with the printer that they had modified to print it. So uh, it's just an awesome example of you know the reason why an organization like NASA would choose open hardware over proprietary systems. We had a, a demo project that one of our engineers had done, and uh, she built a D&D bracer. So you put it on your arm, it had a bunch of switches on it, it ran off of a lily pad board, it had an accelerometer on it, and a little seven segment display. And she just put this demo together to kind of show how all those pieces work together. And uh, it was such a cool idea, and a group of kids took all the design files for each of those individual boards, put them together, created their own custom board out of that that encompassed all of those parts into one solution, basically, and then sold that and started their own company. So that was really cool. Uh, getting to see, you know, just a, a one-off demo project to show the basics of the hardware that we're making suddenly turning into a whole company. Yeah, I already shared the story of the radio badge at Chaos Camp, which is, you know, hands down the most exciting derived work that I've ever seen from my stuff. But uh, there's there, one of the most exciting things. Like, we, we make tools. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff that we all make, uh, uh, tools for people to make other things. And uh, and with um, some of our, our products, especially HackRF1, which is a software-defined radio platform, people are kind of designing uh, radios in software using our tool, uh, or oftentimes those kind of get integrated with special purpose hardware systems, or they're kind of making uh, customized, they're using our equipment as sort of customizable test equipment. So one of the most exciting things for me is when they do interesting things with our product and maybe make some interesting software to go with it and and like you know we designed the thing to pick up radio signals but like and, and transmit radio signals but it turns out it has all kinds of different uses um, and like I, I hear from people who say like oh yeah i've used hacker up to study the way that sharks use electromagnetic uh, sensing to detect prey and like Next week, uh, I'm going to uh, speak at the International Conference on Accelerators and Large Experimental Physics Control Systems because they invited me to speak because like a whole bunch of people who do experimental physics use my hardware. And I had no idea. Like, they, they're doing all this super cool stuff and I can't wait to meet these people and find out more about how they use the tools that I make and, and how interested they are in open source hardware, which is really why they invited me to come speak. Um, but probably the, the next most interesting uh, derived work from one of our products is, is actually a commercial product called AirSpy. Uh, and it's a, it's a software-defined radio platform that's receive only. Uh, so it's kind of a, 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 a little or uh, lesser capable sort of device than HackRF, but it's a, 
uh, uh, lower cost, it's very accessible, uh, and it performs really well for receive only. And uh, it was it was basically uh, designed, it, it, the hardware doesn't have a whole lot in common with HackRF except that it uses the same microcontroller, but the firmware is very much derived from HackRF. And so it was a case where, where a big effort that we made to create like a high performing USB stack for this particular microcontroller ended up getting used uh, in this uh, derived product that, that you know, only so much of it is derived from what we did, but a, but a big part of our effort was the firmware, and they were able to take advantage of that and make something cool out of it. Cool. Well, so I have a, an Oshawa-related question, because there is the Open Source Hardware Association. So what would you guys like to see Oshawa do to, to help out the growth of your businesses and help the formation of, say, other open hardware businesses out there? That's a really tough question. <laughs> Um, I think Oshawa's doing a great job so far, uh, and it's really interesting to see how the certification is, is going and will go in the future. Uh, we're, we're certifying our own products, and uh, but uh, we're not actually sure that that's, uh, like how, how excited we are about that, but we want to see what happens and we want to be a part of it. And because um, I think Ben mentioned earlier, like one of the challenges that we have as open hardware companies is kind of the, the, the problem of people kind of using the term open source as a, as a way to market their, their things that aren't open source in the way we think of open source. Uh, and so that's, that's something that I think is, is beneficial to what Oshawa is doing now. Um, and I think that, that kind of promoting kind of an understanding of the open hardware definition, I'm not sure how, but somehow, I would uh, I would love to see people find, and Oshawa in particular, find new ways to to create more public awareness of what open hardware is. Uh, I, unfortunately, you know, uh, that's a difficult question, and I uh, like how to do that. And I don't have any fantastic solution for that. But but I see this community uh, hopefully heading in that direction. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like it, for, for us, it's I, I I don't have the solutions for for Oshawa either in terms of how to make how to make it happen. But I, I was in in the UK last week at a trade show, uh, a three D printing or additive manufacturing specific trade show, and there were a few companies there that are working on open hardware, um, either components for three D printers or entire systems, and I I talked to a lot of them about. You know, most of the certification, and they weren't aware of it. And so, like, it's really encouraging to, to those people to get their products certified because it helps for all of the you know the open hardware companies to sort of build up that certification network of, of companies and products that are certified, so that there's a clear definite you know a clear line between what is and isn't open hardware. Then again, like, if something you know, is open hardware but doesn't have certification, it's still open hardware. So, you know, it's sort of like if, if somebody doesn't want to um, be a part of a system, you know, you can't force them. But it, it, it would be valuable, I think, for all the companies that are working in, in the space to sort of be able to draw that line more clearly. Okay, so I have another question. So as I've done this in the past, as you go and, and run and create a business, and you, you, you eventually come to this point where you need to raise money to maybe do something bigger. So how, when you go and talk to, say, your colleagues in your industries or talk to investors, how is it received and how do you present yourself and, like, how do those interactions go when you come and say, yeah, we give away the designs for free. It's awesome. Like, how do you, how do you approach that? Uh, I mean, we're very open about that. <laughs> um, our, our, our company, you know, today, um, we haven't raised any venture capital. Um, we've uh, we've spoken to investors before, but in general, I, I mean, it's it's definitely the education needs to happen up front. You know, it's like, well, what do you mean you don't have any IP? Well, we do, but it's you know it's protect, protected under copyright, and then we let we you know um, license it freely so anybody can use it. <laughs> um, so it's definitely it's it's not something that most <laughs> typical investors understand in, in our experience, but I'm not sure if you, if you 
Do you have an yeah. answer? It's about the same thing. I think usually the conversation sort of stops right at the point of, wait, you, you give away everything? <laughs> and they just sort of shut down at that point, and then you have to explain open source to them, and then it becomes more of a teaching moment rather than a negotiation on money, I think, or that kind of thing. Um, and we've gotten pushback on that before, but I think typically it just falls apart because eventually with the venture capital thing, it a lot of times comes down to, okay, and then we get this that we get to protect out of it, and that just doesn't work. So. Yeah. I, the elevator pitch for open source hardware companies is terrible. Like, <laughs> it's, it's so, like, my company makes tools for hackers, and they're open source hardware. And it turns out, like, in an elevator, it's a lot easier to explain that hacking is great and worthwhile activity than it is to explain open source hardware. Um, and um, the, like, I'm, I don't know, like, like these other companies, I, I never saw venture capital at all. And Great Spec Edits is entirely bootstrapped. And a big part of why I was able to do that was crowdfunding. And so uh, crowdfunding is great for open source hardware, I think, because uh, because you're able to reach, you're able to raise funds from you know, that community of people that is interested in your open source hardware. And um, it, it's, uh, and I think that's why it's been so big in this community because because the investment community hasn't really come around to open source hardware yet. But I think in time it will. I think in time investors are going to see people like us who are building open source hardware companies that are successful, and they're going to realize that it's possible to have open source hardware companies that are successful and that they may be worth investing in. Uh, but as far as I've seen, we're not there yet, or the investment community isn't there yet, and so I don't even try. That's, that's fair. Um, so there's probably a lot of people out here who have their ideas, who have their board, who have their, their thing they're building, and, and now they either want to move on to, yeah, I want to sell five of them, I want to sell ten of them, I want to sell ten thousand of them, staff. So do you guys have any advice for them? Because bootstrapping is a hard thing, and it's an awesome thing. And, and maybe the fact that you're all in Colorado, away from echo chambers that may be on different coasts, might feed into that. But what, what sort of advice do you give to people to make that possible? Well, I definitely advise people to try crowdfunding. Uh, and crowdfunding is, is great in, in a lot of ways. And one of the biggest <coughs> ways is because it's market research. Um, and you can find out whether or not you have a market for your product at the price point for your, that you're, you have intended for your product, like before you invest in manufacturing, you know. Um, of course, people have been burned by crowdfunding too, um, but uh, if you go into crowdfunding with a, a mindset that it's, a, it's an experiment, that you're going to find something out, you're going to learn from the process, uh, and don't go into crowdfunding with a kind of a, a an idea that you, you, you've already come to a conclusion. Um, if you're open to what you learn from crowdfunding, I think you can really make it work. And you also have to go into crowdfunding with a, a mindset towards contingencies. You really need to contingency plan. Like, what, what are all the various outcomes that could happen from this crowdfunding campaign? And do you have, uh, how are you going to handle each of those different contingencies? And if you do that kind of upfront work, it can be a, an extremely beneficial tool to grow grow your business and, and bring a product to market. I think the best advice I would say is document your potential product in as many ways as you can. Uh, you know, if it, share your design files, but also have a video of it working. Uh, make a cool project with it. Find a friend and have them make a cool project with it, and then have them document it, because I think the more ways you can inspire people with your work, the more likely they're going to be interested in it. And, you have to understand that some people are, are very inspired if they can look at a schematic and that really will get them jazzed up to do something with it, but other people need to see that flashy video or they need to hear the flashy, you know, mini music that you make with it or whatever it is. Um, they, they need their, their own inspiration to want to buy it, so that would be my recommendation. Um, the only thing I'd add is, well, our founder likes to say that he's set out to to build a company, not to build a printer. Um, and, I, and that like really resonates with me from the standpoint that we focus a lot on logistics and on systems and on how to make a company work. Because if you're gonna have a lot easier time um, 
basically getting started with you know limited resources if you're not fighting all the problems that come from like from systems that don't work or from bad quality control or from you know not having a supply chain that's you know that's lined up to get products out the door so like you need to focus on the product but you also need to think about all the less sexy things and it's like it's not fun like that stuff sucks but there are you know good tools to make it easier and if you focus on those things then you're going to end up with a with a business that actually functions um, you know that makes money and you know you can hire people you can afford to like do all the things that you need to do to get product out the door versus just being like my product's super cool buy it and then you have no way to actually deliver it you know yeah and that that's can be one problem with crowdfunding too is people just have no idea what actually goes into getting something to ship right yeah, yeah. so so this brings a very important question what's the worst part of setting up to do it yourself like what, what drives you, I mean, this is, this is another thing, where, like, it's always good to find inches that need to be scratched. Like, what, what drives you nuts right now? What, what if somebody could just make it go away? Do you want to go away? We're all thinking. Yeah. Oh. oh, everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. Everything is perfect. Um, I, I think the reason that's a hard question is because Part of the enjoyment of open source is that it's a problem to solve. You know, I, a lot of people I think enjoy open source hardware because it's not a complete solution. There's, it's about 60% of the way there, and then you get to customize the rest of it. And so, I think there's that that urge to solve problems and to fix things your own way that sort of negates that. Yeah, and like I, I think. Most of the, the challenges that I've faced in building an open source hardware business are just challenges in building a business. Uh, like making making my business an open source hardware company uh, does, didn't make it any harder. Like like uh, the, the hard things are like how do you manufacture a thing? And how do you make it sure it works reliably? And how do you reach your customers? And how do you ship things? And how do you make sure your customers are happy? and you give them support. And all those things are things that, that any company that builds a thing has, has to deal with. And, uh, and you need to have some kind of plan for how you're going to accomplish those things, regardless of whether it's a closed source project, project or an open source project. Uh, those, are, those are the important aspects of building a successful product company. I thought of something too. Uh, I, I, I'd say in addition to that, one, you know, one challenge we have is just getting the community involved early in a project. Um, like we share our development, like we, we update our, our development servers every, I think 15 minutes um, with stuff that we're working on in R&D. But if nobody's looking at it, then it, you know, it's still just our engineering team working on the projects. And it's like, the reason we're sharing is because we want people to get involved. The challenge with hardware is that, you know, it's not like software where they can just download the code and then they've got it there to work on it on their end. It's like, do they have to print it? Do they have to, you know, have a sheet metal fabricator make the electronics case to see if it fits? So, so it's really, it can be difficult to like actually engage with the community early on in the project to really like deliver on the promise of open source. Okay. Um, all right, so we're pretty, yeah, I think we're pretty close here. So there's one last, this is another hard question, but is there, it's one of these big, touchy feeling things. So, so why do it this way versus any other way? I mean, everyone's kind of, I think, has their moment about why they want to build open source hardware or open source software. Is there any like, was there one moment you woke up in the morning and you're like, shoot, I'm gonna open everything up today? Like, what, <laughs> how, how did this happen for you? Uh, in a, like I said before, our founder was already committed to it when he started the company. But for me personally getting involved in the, in, the, in the desktop 3D printing community, it was like being able to see this global community of people working together and solving hard problems and improving things rapidly. Like uh, my first personal 3D printer that I bought was actually a Lulzbot, and it was a, a Lulzbot Prusa Mendel, which was designed, uh, which was based on Joseph Prusa, uh, who's also here, his design for Prusa Mendel. Um, 
And as soon as I got it, I printed off some files from Thingiverse uh, to improve the extruder because I didn't like the way it was designed. And there were like, you know, 15, 20 different designs to choose from. And so when you've been sort of immersed on that end of the community as a user, like seeing how great things can be when you can modify your hardware because of the work of so many people around the world, it's really hard to then just turn your back on it and say, well, fuck it. I, I can figure this out myself and I can do a better job than everybody else and it's all because of me. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And yet, you know, we see it happening a lot in our industry and other industries too. It's like, you know, we all got here by learning from other things and if people didn't share that information, we wouldn't be where we are. So it just, it's basically just the right thing to do. I, for me personally, it was, um, I fell into electronics. I never studied them. I didn't know anything about them when I was in school. Uh, I kind of haphazardly found the job at Smartphone when I graduated, and I got to learn electronics, and I didn't have to sit through college classes to do it, and it was because people shared this information, and they made it accessible, and that was really, really cool. And then getting to interact with the community and seeing how many people from different walks of life were interacting with this material to to solve problems in their own lives and that it was possible for them to do it because people were sharing information. It was so incredibly inspiring. So that, that was my main reason. Yeah, and I, I really like um, I really like what you two said and Ben you, you said it's the right thing to do. And like that's exactly that's exactly why I do open source hardware is because it's it's just the right thing to do. Uh, it, I I never even considered making a, a closed source hardware company. Um, and like I came from a background, before I learned electronics, before I ever thought about starting a company, I came from a, a long career in IT and information security and R&D, uh, like a research, computer security and wireless communication security research and like every single thing that I ever did in my entire career that I was proud of was something that I did with open source software with the help of software that somebody had given me. And so open source was just a part of my life and a part of my career, it always had been. And when I started doing hardware, it was just natural that everything that I would create, I would give away as open source because that's what we did. That was the right thing to do. Um, and it always was the right thing to do for me, uh, coming from an open source software background. And, um, it, and so, you know, there are a lot of interesting benefits of open source, some of which we've touched on today, like the ability for people to understand and design or modify a design and, and the ability for people to kind of support their own product or find somebody else who can support a product, even if the, the manufacturer goes out of business or something. There are, there, are, there are tons of different benefits to the end user of open source, but the bottom line, the reason why I do open source hardware is just it's just because it's the right thing to do. Okay, so I'm gonna start opening up for questions. I mean, I'm sort of exhausted my bevy of questions, but I'm sure someone out there has much, much more interesting questions than I do. So if you can raise your hand, I will come up. And why do you push this hand? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, you guys, for being on the panel. It's awesome. Um, my question is about regula regulations, regulatory bodies, and navigating that kind of landscape. I know that open source hardware has got sort of a back door on the whole thing. It's got a sneaky route to getting stuff out without having to seek or out of an or anything like that. I'm wondering if you can tell us stories about your experience navigating that landscape and also maybe some advice to people making open hardware about how to do it themselves. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know that open source hardware is really a sneaky backdoor. Uh, I think it's just that a lot of open source hardware companies are small and don't think about it and are able to get around the rules because nobody's enforcing too much uh, on uh, with smaller companies. Um, so like we, we do CD mark our products. Um, and um, although we didn't do that at first, it's something that we kind of learned over time that we needed to do. Um, we don't undergo FCC testing for some of our products specifically because we make test equipment and, and there's an exemption for test equipment. Um, and it's that exemption that you know, allows a general purpose software defined radio product to exist um, because otherwise you know, there, there is no rule under in the 
SEC rigs that actually would allow such a product to be sold otherwise. Uh, but you know, you can buy a bench top signal generator, uh, and the reason that you're able to buy that is because there's an exemption for test equipment. And so uh, there are certain little things like that, like that exemption for test equipment, that some open source hardware may be able to take advantage of, but in general, open source hardware uh, cannot. In, in my experience, anyone have anything to add? Yeah, I mean we. We see EMR and we get FCC testing and, and all that stuff done for, this, for the same reasons. I mean, we're, we have distribution centers, you know, in, in various other countries, and we uh, we market our products, you know, via Amazon and other, you know, and, uh, retailers like the actual concrete. We, uh, what is the term I'm looking for? Brick and mortar. Thank you. Concrete. <laughs> concrete resellers. We don't do brick and mortar. That's all. Um, well, Micro Center is a concrete reason. Anyway, uh, but so we, yeah, we, um, the, the bottom line is like, we do all that stuff and it's expensive and it's painful, but we didn't do it in the beginning. So I think you're right to like people, when companies are small, they can get away with out doing it. What it boils down to. They learn. I would say, as far as people trying to navigate that on their own, um, ask questions. Find somebody at another company and ask them what they've learned the hard way. Uh, because I know from SparkFun's experience, we've had a lot of hard learning experiences with things like that, and we've had to grow and change our processes because of that, and so I think just leverage the community, you know? Hey, what's up? Um, so, this may apply more to SparkFun and the left, because you're kind of a smaller company, as you said, there's people are here. Uh, but if you consider working with either like mentors, smaller startups, or maybe working with uh, accelerator programs, trying to encourage and promote open source nature and in your businesses? That's a good question. Is it for now? I, <laughs> um, we haven't specifically talked about that. I, as far as I know, there might be plans going on in other parts of the company with that kind of thing. Um, but I, sort of what I was just saying, you know, we're, we try and be a resource for the community. And so I think you could go to any SparkFun employee and ask them, like, hey, what advice do you have for me on this? And it, they would all be willing to talk your ear off about it because we're all really excited about this stuff. So uh, I think in that regard, that's about where we've helped others on that. Yeah, I mean, so that we're sort of the same boat. Like we haven't specifically implemented any programs for doing stuff like that, but we um, we do document like all of our processes online. So it's like. If somebody wants to know how to set up a manufacturing line for 3D printers, they can go to develop.lfobjects.com and learn how we do it. Um, so, I, you know, I think in some respects, like, to be a, a company that's doing a good job documenting your open source products, you have to spend a lot, you know, expend a lot of bandwidth, like, getting that documentation published. And so, <laughs> some of that is like, that's where we're giving back. Um, but I mean, if, if we had the bandwidth, we'd be, we'd be all for it. I'll, I'll add a little something, even though but we are the, kind of the smaller company up here. One of the reasons we're smaller is because we outsource our manufacturing. Uh, another reason we're smaller is because we don't do resale, retail sales, we only do wholesale. So we kind of outsource retail as well. And like, you know, we outsource manufacturing, we outsource our sales, uh, we give away all our designs. Like, what do we have left? Like, what are we? And like, some people have told me, like, well, what you are really is a brand. And, and to some extent that's true, but I like to think that what we are is what we give away. Uh, like the reason that we're a successful company and that people like buying our products and that we keep growing is because we give away everything we possibly can. And so I, and that includes, you know, free advice and, and, um, and documenting our processes, whatever we're able to and, and, and trying to share the thing, events like this and, and um, like I've never been involved in, in any kind of formal uh, uh, mentorship of other companies or in an accelerator program, but I constantly am talking to people who are like, hey, you've done this thing, I'm thinking about doing this vaguely similar thing, what do you think? And uh, I, I always have conversations with people at conferences uh, or online uh, about like, hey, can you can you advise me on like, do you think that this this crowdfunding campaign might work, or what could I do better, and uh, how can I maybe build a business 
Um, and so we, we constantly are, are trying to help folks in informal ways. Hi, so I've started dabbling in, uh, in the teaching aspect of electronics and software, and one of the things I've come across um, currently with seventh graders is I find there's a gap between uh, a breadboard and plugging in things and wires and things like that, and uh, a more expensive solution like Little Bit to where everything is just you can plug and play. And this is a little, this is easy but too expensive, and this is a little on the hard side, and then there's things in between, like the Seed Studio Grill Kit and Tinker Kit and a few things. And I was just wondering, but but I find that they're using different connectors, so it's not plugging, you can't cross correlate them very well. Is there any movement either by you know, this organization or among the industry and open hardware to get that middle ground of plugging in a temperature sensor or an LED or something? Not having to do the red board, but not having to solder, and then not having something to have a bite. Yeah, it's, it's an unsolved problem, I think. Like you said, there's the upside to open source is that everybody can do it their own way, and the downside to open source is that everybody can do it their own way. Um, and you run into issues, you know, for example, the connectors. Uh, that depends very much on your supply chains and what you can get pricing wise and can you can you use those connectors in your machines um, those are problems we've run into when we've looked at other designs or worked with other companies and said well no we can't actually manufacture what you're trying to give us because it doesn't work on our manufacturing line so we have to change it uh, so yeah I, I don't know if we have a solution for that right now uh, that's quite so cohesive across the open source industry have any suggestions though? We really are all ears. I think we have one more short question. We were doing a lot better than we were. Yep. Yeah. Ten. Thank you very much for this amazing panel. Uh, I have a question. How the community's voice contributing to the business decisions? I think for, for SparkCon, uh, we try to listen to our customers and the community as much as possible. We attend events like this. Um, you know, we, we have a whole very dedicated customer support team that reads through our forums and answers emails and phone calls and all that kind of stuff. And we, we try and give as many avenues for communication as possible and to listen to that. Um, and sometimes it's a little painful in the communication because people can be really brutally honest if we make mistakes. <laughs> But it's good for us to hear that, and it's it definitely it's something that we take in take in mind and keep in mind when we're working on stuff. Uh, you know, for us, especially like in the education realm, we, we make a lot of kits for that, and education customers have a very different set of needs than uh, you know folks who are here and can maybe work with soldering, and that's okay. But maybe if you're trying to teach electronics to elementary school kids, you don't want to give them a really hot soldering iron because they're either going to hurt themselves or you. Um, <laughs> So, and we've had to listen to that feedback over the years and change what we're making and how we're making it to address those needs. I don't know if that answers your question, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo that. Like, it, I think we see our customers pulling a lot more than we're pushing because we don't have like a closed R&D team that's doing things in a you know in a in a room without windows where nobody can see in. So. If, um, in general, we're getting more feedback during the development process, so we're able to sort of tailor our products to meet the needs of, of customers versus developing a product and then trying to convince people as to why they need it. I, I think the biggest part for us is uh, the biggest community involvement we get in, in the growth of our company is, is really just in product development. And you know, we're coming up with ideas all the time and, and chatting about them in public IRC channels and on Twitter and and, uh, and our mailing lists that are entirely in public. And, and we get a lot of feedback from people. Um, sometimes people kind of build their own um, implementations of things. Sometimes we build an implementation of something and share it with others. And, but we have tons of projects that are just in a prototype phase and, and we, we, that we take around and show to people and uh, or show online. And, and so we, 
we're extremely open with our development process. Like everything we ever develop, we we have on GitHub, and, and like uh, we we accept pull requests, and we try to get people interested in uh, in what we're doing, and, and try to get feedback from people about what we're building, because ultimately we're a product company, and, and what we do in the future builds around what products we make, and so we're we're very much focused on trying to. Uh, trying to come up with ideas that people want and people like, and we kind of kind of uh, have our our development process driven as much as possible by our uh, collaboration with the community.